This is my 2000 B5 S4. The list of things we've done to this car keeps getting longer and today will be no exception. We're in the middle of tuning this car and our first data log brought up a bunch of problems with the car that we'll be addressing today. The main thing that we're going to fix today is the severe misfire that happens when I'm at partial throttle at around 2500 RPMs. Along with this, we're going to clear some of the lights on the dash by throwing in a refurbished ABS control unit because mine's faulty. Ever since I bought this car, whenever you start the engine up and drive, there is a slew of warning lights. Specifically, ABS, brake, check engine, and airbag are almost always on. Generally, when you have a whole slew of warning lights on a car, the best approach is to take them one at a time and try to fix them individually. Two of these are related, however. My brake warning light is on all the time, and so is my ABS light. If you do a little bit of research, you'll see that this combination of codes generally results from a faulty ABS computer. I went ahead and confirmed this by connecting to a smart OBD2 scanner, and I wasn't able to connect specifically to the ABS computer. Since the wiring looked okay, I made the assumption that the ABS computer itself was at fault. To replace these, you have a few options. I bought a working one from a donor car that had been refurbished by a company that specializes in that. This way I don't have to reprogram it to the car and whatnot. It's actually a really cost-effective way to do it, because you just send them your old faulty unit for them to refurbish for another car in the future. On these cars, the ABS system has a pump half and a computer half. My goal was to not really touch the pump half and just adjust the bracket enough to be able to remove the computer half. The computer was held on with two electrical harnesses and six torque screws. Some of these can be a bit challenging to get to, but you are able to do it without removing the entire system from the car. I suggest you unbolt the metal bracket holding the entire ABS pump and module onto the car, and then you can slide it to give yourself a little bit more clearance. While we're removing this, let's talk about how ABS actually works. Generally speaking, each one of your wheels has a wheel speed sensor that tells your car's computer how fast the wheels are turning. When you step on the brakes, it pumps brake fluid through the master cylinder and the ABS motor to the wheels themselves. The ABS computer has access to the wheel speed sensors and is able to tell if the car is slipping due to a change in the wheel speed. These round tubes in the ABS computer itself are solenoids, and they're basically a wire wrapped in a coil inside of a plastic housing. These are slid onto a set of valves in the ABS motor, which connects to each specific brake line. If the computer detects a slip in a certain wheel, it can send current through that specific solenoid. Current flowing through a coiled wire creates a directed magnetic field that we can use to open or shut the valve to a specific brake line. This opening and closing of the valves can adjust the brake pressure and regain traction. It's also why ABS feels like it's thumping on your feet. Sorry if I got a little bit technical there, electricity and magnetism was one of my favorite things to study while I was in school. As you could see, the new unit simply slides into place, and then it's really a matter of tightening all the screws to get it on there. Just like any other time you're working with an electrical harness, these are 20 year old wires you're messing with, so be careful when you put them back in place. Here's something to keep in mind. If you buy a brand new unit, you're gonna need to program it with VCDS to work with your car. I will not have to do this because this is a refurbished model from the same engine code. Once you start the car, it takes a second for the pumps to prime and then the light should go away. A few moments later. I am so stoked. No check engine light, no ABS, no brake light. This is ridiculous. I am way happier than I thought I would be. Dude, it's cool to see this car coming together. I'm actually really happy. Now that that was checked off the list, I wanted to move on to something a little bit different. The weather where I live is very temperamental. Some days it's cold and some days it's warm, so you gotta take advantage of the nice days. If you've followed my channel for a little bit, you know I'm in the process of learning to vinyl wrap. I think it's gonna be a fun skill to learn, and today is another great opportunity to practice. I ordered some vivid carbon fiber wrap, and I wanted to go over the wood trim on the interior. I like the wood trim a lot, but the plastic sealant is faded and the carbon will look a lot better. Keep in mind, this is my first attempt at wrapping interior pieces, and it's my second attempt at wrapping at all. I really don't think this is going to turn out perfect, and I'll likely redo it in the future. The main reason I don't think this is going to turn out perfect is that the wood trim that I'm replacing is actually cracked in a bunch of places, and that texture is definitely going to come through the vinyl. I still think this will be a big improvement in modernizing the interior of this car, though. Since this was a learning experience, I specifically spent a lot of time learning how to properly calculate the right amount of vinyl wrap to cut for a specific piece. I also thought it would be a good opportunity to practice wrapping parts that were still attached to the car, as well as pieces that I could remove. 
I also took my time to feel with the heat gun and learn the operating temperature of the vinyl wrap. The first time I tried vinyl wrapping, I was in way colder temperatures than you should do this in, and it is a night and day difference today and the first time I tried it. The wood trim around the shifter was the most faded wood in the car, and it's the main reason why I ordered this vinyl in the first place. Being able to replace the fade with some nice looking carbon is really fun. I think the hardest part about doing this was learning how to cut vinyl and still have enough to tuck under different parts of trim. I definitely think this is something I'll get better at with time and practice though. One of the reasons I didn't remove the trim in the door panels is that it was pretty easy to just tuck the vinyl behind it. This was a really good opportunity to practice this technique, and on top of that, this wood is really brittle, so I didn't want to risk breaking it removing it from the door panel. Some of you may be asking why I don't just order real carbon fiber trim for this car, and there's a really simple answer to that. Those specific pieces are about $500, and in my project cars, that $500 could be used very well elsewhere. I absolutely love the look of this carbon trim on the inside, and I think it honestly really modernizes the interior. I specifically like how the Quattro logo turned out. I'm not sure if this is just due to the nicer film, but wrapping the interior had a much smaller learning curve as opposed to wrapping the roof of the TT. You can see here a crack in the original wood trim, and this is what I was talking about when I was talking about imperfections that'll come through the vinyl. Not perfect, but definitely better than it was. Speaking of wrapping roofs, however, we're gonna wrap the roof of the S4. This will be my second attempt ever at wrapping a roof, and it is going to be phenomenal practice for wrapping an entire car. This part of the car is very sun faded, and wrapping it in gloss black will be a lot nicer. I cleaned the car with isopropyl alcohol, cut out the vinyl, and started lighting it down. I noticed almost immediately that the nicer temperature made working with vinyl so much easier. It was so much more forgiving than it was when I tried to apply it to the TT in colder weather. I was able to stretch the material uniformly and it honestly felt like a liquid in my hands at some points. My thought process was to try to gloss out as much as I could before I cut out the sunroof and then start tucking things in. I then went through and cut off the edges and made sure to start tucking. Unlike the earlier film, this film has a clear plastic cover on top of it to keep the gloss finish from scratching and or folding. I wasn't super sure if I was supposed to keep this on when I glossed it out or not, but I ended up keeping it on for the first 75% of the process. Yet again, the film being an operating temperature came to my advantage when there were some air bubbles that I could simply press out through the material itself. Super wild and super satisfying to see happen. It's fun to learn new skills, and this is something I definitely consider myself as a beginner at. I am a very basic beginner when it comes to this, but I'm determined to wrap the TT. I think it would be a tremendous learning experience, and honestly, it's really fun to do. The results I got on the S4 were incredibly encouraging. This is a night and day improvement from when I first tried it on the TT. There are still some imperfections here and there, but most of those are from divots in the actual paint on the car. In hindsight, I could have wet sanded, but overall, I'm ecstatic with this. Now it's time to move on to fixing the misfire of the car. The tuners at Motiza noticed in the logs that both of my O2 sensors are shot. This one should be really easy to get to. The primary O2 sensors are incredibly important when it comes to your car running. They tell the ECU your current air fuel ratio, and it uses that to adjust timing and fuel. If both of these are shot, that means your engine is pretty much guessing when it comes to how much fuel it asks for. That would explain why under partial throttle, the car got confused and didn't send nearly enough fuel or sent too much and caused a misfire. It's completely acceptable to use normal wrenches to remove O2 sensors. However, for cars like this, where they're not easily accessible, a crow's foot really comes in handy. 
I created this monstrous concoction of extensions just to reach the O2 sensors, and honestly, it worked really well. The previous owner installed test pipes on this car, so these O2 sensors were recently put into those and hence weren't too stuck. These are a little annoying to get to, but they weren't really as bad as what everywhere online would lead you to believe. My car was throwing an intermittent check engine light for specifically the primary O2 sensor on bank one, which is the passenger side. This car has two primary O2 sensors, and whenever your car has two, you want to replace both at the same time, because in all honesty, they probably have the same amount of wear on them. My tuner noticed in the logs that both of my O2 sensors were reading weird values, it's just that one was reading a lot worse than the other. The hardest part of this job is not getting the sensors out, it's getting the sensors back into their hole. You have to be pretty delicate when it comes to threading an O2 sensor, and my hand simply didn't fit back there, so I used this little crow's foot to get it started. I took my time to make sure that it didn't strip anything. I also used this opportunity to rewire the cable that connects to the O2 sensor since it wasn't really attached to anything, so I just used the stock wiring harness for some of the other cables in the same area. Here you can see me hooked onto the O2 sensor of the other side. People say this one is a lot harder to get to, but honestly, I found it about the same as the first one. If your 2.7 has an automatic transmission, however, that will not be the case. Maybe my car is different than the others, but they're all easy to get off. Weird, I'm not gonna complain. I was having trouble with losing my extension, so take this O2 sensor. Just like removing the other O2 sensor, this is really just a simple and methodical dance between you and the crow's foot trying to remove it inch by inch. Eventually it'll come loose and you can throw in the new one. Just like I predicted, the wear on this one is just as bad as the other side. Probably a good idea we did both. Here's a comparison side by side of a new O2 sensor and the original. My tuner suggested and was very, very convincing that if you're gonna put an O2 sensor in your car, go with an OEM spec one. So I turned to Bosch. Apparently some of the aftermarket O2 sensor options tend to not work from the box. So that would be really frustrating. If you're a keen observer on this video, you may notice that some of my PCV boost piping looks a little bit different on this car now. I upgraded my PCV system because of a major vacuum leak, and I happened to do that in between doing both of the O2 sensors. I figured it would make more sense in the video to group the O2 sensors together. I ordered a 034 Motorsports PCV upgrade kit. On this version of the 2.7T, the spider hose is known for going out because it's made of plastic, and it even goes underneath the intake manifold, so it is plastic that is rapidly heated and cooled. It is horrendously brittle and mine has lots of vacuum leaks in it. I can see a few of the cracks through the intake manifold itself. This is a comprehensive kit from 034 Motorsports that replaces all of that and updates a little bit of it. It sits here behind the intake manifold and it, well, looks like a spider. It's connected all over the engine and it connects to the front under the intake manifold to the F-hose. This is also known for going out on these cars, so I had one of these on the way as well. This spider system has three or four connections in the back of the engine bay, depending on what year car you have. If your block is like mine, you'll also have a line that goes underneath the intake manifold. Now I'm just gonna try to pull everything all out at once, including the F-hose, because I have a replacement that I'm gonna use anyways. Seems easier that way. You have to do quite a bit of finagling to get this out, but it really should slide out the back. My hose was actually so cracked that it ended up breaking even more on the way out. Goes to show you that you should replace this eventually. Wonder where the vacuum leak was. Here is the spider hose outside of the car connected to the F hose. You can see where my main vacuum leak was, which was underneath the intake manifold, and it pretty much sheared off completely. The 034 replacement part comes in a bunch of different pieces and we'll need to assemble it to make it look just like this hose. The new part is routed slightly differently and it replaces the location of some of the check valves. For the most part, you can just try to make it look identical to the stock spider hose. I ordered a new pancake valve as well as an F hose from 034 and those are also going on at the same time. 
There's a one-way valve attached to the F-hose, which is relocated on the 034 system. The new location is actually that silver valve sticking out of the top of the spider hose itself. That connects to a hose that goes under the intake manifold and back into the F-hose. This whole system seems pretty complicated, but it's just a lot of vacuum lines. The main purpose of the PCV valve and this spider system is to control emissions. It takes gases produced by the crankcase and routes them back into the engine's combustion chamber so that they're safely burned without spewing them into the environment. This also eliminates a lot of the sludge buildup. Installing this in one piece would be pretty annoying because the spider hose goes under the intake manifold. Since I was replacing the F hose at the same time, I decided to use the tube that goes under the intake manifold and install that with the F hose from the front of the car. Then I'd worry about connecting it with all the room in the world in the back. This made this way easier. The silicone is going to create a much more airtight seal than the plastic PCV system that was in here originally. This is where I ran into my first problem of the day, and honestly, this was a pretty minor one in hindsight. This install was going too perfectly, and I knew I was bound for something to happen, and then it did. I snapped one of my green PCV check valves that connects to my vacuum lines. These are a necessary component to keep the engine running well because they make sure air does not flow backwards. In other words, I couldn't just eliminate it with a silicone tube. I ordered an OEM one to replace it, but that was gonna take a little bit of time to get here. I spent the rest of the day buttoning everything up and making sure the car was good to sit for a little bit. New day to mess things up. We're back on the S4. Goals to get it drivable today. Yesterday, I completely snapped one of the vacuum check valves. So we ran to a bunch of stores, found this one for the time being while we wait for an OEM to come in. This will at least get the car moving. While installing this, I noticed that the check valve that is the OEM green one is actually a reducer as well. The check valve I bought at the store is technically rated for the same amount of pressure, but it's not a reducer. So I had to use a silicone vacuum line as a sleeve. This works just fine, but this will definitely be coming off when I get my OEM part in the mail. I put the temporary replacement back in place and I went and rechecked all of the vacuum lines and the hose clamps making sure everything was tightened and back in order. It was now time to finally test the car and see if we removed the misfire. Along with that, we're gonna get new logs and send them to the tuner. No misfire, baby. That's what we love to see. Yes, sir. Okay, low throttle, no misfires anymore. That is exactly what my goal was. Yes. Super excited we finally fixed this partial throttle misfire and the car is honestly inspiring a lot more confidence now that it runs pretty well. I went ahead and spent the rest of the day getting more logs for my tuner on the base map that he sent over. Now that he can actually read the primary O2 sensors he can tell if the car is behaving well and he got back to me in a matter of hours and said that the car looks better than ever. There's something really satisfying about getting a blessing from your tuner that your project car, which honestly you didn't know if it was ever going to run right, is running really well. Made some pretty insane progress this episode. The car's running better than ever and we removed three out of the four warning lights on the dash. It's also looking a lot better inside and out. But we've still got a long ways to go. In the next episode we're going to continue the process of tuning and start working on tuning for different octanes. I've also got some pretty cool upgrades for the car on the way. Thank you so much for watching. If you enjoyed the video, consider dropping a like and subscribing for more. The amount of support I've been getting is absolutely bonkers, and it makes me super happy to make each of these episodes. I seriously can't thank you enough. Have a wonderful day.